hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll have an idea of why I've put a question mark at the end of that title of otters being seen as a conservation success story. So just sort of right back to basics, when we're talking about otters in the UK, we're talking about just one species. So here are the 13 species of otters that are found around the world. Um, the Eurasian otter is the one that we have in the UK and they're native to the UK and Ireland and across Europe and much of Asia. Um, there's some confusion sometimes because we have otters in the UK inhabiting freshwater habitats and coastal habitats, but they're all the same species, they're all Lutra Lutra. And otters are perfectly adapted for aquatic way of life. So they've got webbed feet and a rudder-like tail for swimming and a really dense um, hair. So many hairs packed together in, 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 on their body to help keep them warm. So unlike other aquatic mammals like seals or whales, they don't have any blubber. So they're dependent on this, this thick hair. And otters have really large ranges. We've got some evidence from radio tracking studies that they can travel up to tens of kilometres in just one night. Um, so their home range might be up to something like 40 kilometres, but it might be as small as four kilometres of riverbank. And that will be dependent on the quality of the habitat, the availability of prey and the proximity of other otters, either as a positive factor because they're looking for a mate or a negative factor as competition. And otters are mainly solitary. You might see photographs like these that appear to look like groups of otters, but what all of these are is an adult female with her nearly adult cubs, and she won't have new cubs until these ones have left, and they stay with her until they are adult size. And so all, that's what all of these are. And she'll typically have between one and three cubs. One and two are the most common, three, three is quite uncommon. And then the male has no input at all in, in raising the young. So otters live at low densities and that's that's maintained through um, aggressive interactions. So I was involved with Cardiff University's post-mortem project. So otters that are found dead in England and Wales. And if, if you ever see them, please report them to the Environment Agency or NRW so they can be sent to Cardiff University for post-mortem examination. And we found there that fighting injuries are very common. Um, particularly uh, males, male otters have a penis bone, a baculum, um, and they're often broken in these fights and testes are also damaged. So, so that's what helps to maintain them at low densities. And of course, their diet as well, the prey availability will impact their density as well. So what, what we've done again from otters that have been found dead is we've examined the prey remains in their stomachs so that we can look at what they're eating. And fish do make up a large proportion of their diet. So on average, um, 71%, um, but they are what we'd call a generalist predator. So they will also, amphibians are also important to them and crustaceans and mammals and birds. So they will take what is locally abundant and that might vary seasonally as well, as well as depending on, on where they are. So for example, um, when amphibians, when frogs are, um, congregating to breed, um, the proportion of otter diet, the, the proportion of frogs in otter diet will in, increase quite a lot. So what, what otters are um, known for um, is that they had this huge population crash in the 1950s and 60s. And since then, national surveys across all, all of the devolved nations have, have, have been carried out to track what's been happening with the population since then. And as you can see from, from these maps, every sort of eight to 10 years, there's a national survey and we can see the density, the colour getting darker. And that means basically that more of the survey sites had signs for otters. So we had this good recovery from 1977 up to 2010, moving almost from um, west to east. Wales um, managed to maintain more otters when we had those population crashes. And that recovery has been put down to recovery from pollution. So these were bioaccumulative uh, chemicals which biomagnify up the food chain, which means otters being predators at the top of the food chain ended up with levels of these chemicals that can impact survival, reproduction and development. And again, looking at otters that have been found dead by measuring these chemicals in their livers, we've been able to track 
the decline of those chemicals in their bodies. But unfortunately, because they are so persistent, we still measure to have some measurement of those chemicals even today, decades after they have been banned. So otters were seen as this conservation success story and, and often hailed as as a sort of poster boys and girls of conservation. And I think about sort of five to 10 years ago, this had led to a little bit of complacency that perhaps we didn't need to worry about otters anymore. Um, but me and some other colleagues were aware of, of ongoing potential threats to them. So we thought it was important that we had some continued monitoring. And that's why um, Cardiff University and Natural Resources Wales collaborated to do a sixth otter survey of Wales. And this involved going to the same sites that have been surveyed before. So there's 1,073 sites across Wales. And we look for sprint, which is their droppings and footprints. And unfortunately, the results of that survey has indicated a, a bit of a downturn. So you can see that from the 70s up until 2010, there was a steady increase in the percentage of sites that had signs for otters. And then we've had this bit of a downturn in the most recent survey. And we don't know whether that will continue or, um, or whether it's you know, a bit of a fluctuation at the top of their carrying capacity, but that's yet to be seen. And if we look at that, um, split by um, hydrometric area, which is more or less catchments. Um, you can see that um, the D is actually not, not doing too badly, and it's right next to the seven, which is also doing really quite well. So um, some of the catchments had really big declines, like the TV went from being in the 90s down to into the 50s. Um, if we focus in a little bit more on the D, so the, um, the take home message here is the green dots on the map are where signs of otters were found on the surveys and the red or orange dots are where they weren't found so you've got lots of green dots there so that's still still looking good um, on the D. And you can see from from this table taken from the National Survey report that you had that on the D had that same um, recovery. So you went from 30 percent in the 1970s steadily upwards, 41 percent, 49 percent, 78 percent, 93 percent. And you've had this slight downturn um, on its own. Um, we probably wouldn't worry about that sort of level of, of, of difference between 93 and 85 percent. But if you put it into that context of what's happened elsewhere in Wales, I think this is something that we really need to keep an eye on. And that begs the question, why? Why have we seen this change um, in, in otter status? Um, they are found dead on the road, so they are, do suffer from road traffic casualties, although that has um, there hasn't we wouldn't have thought that the, the increase in that would be enough to see this change. You might have seen headlines like this with some research that I was involved in looking at new toxic chemicals um, in otter bodies. And although we can measure those in otter bodies as yet, it's a little bit difficult to attribute those to health impacts, although that work is ongoing at Cardiff University. Other work at Cardiff University is uh, with a friend of mine, Nia Thomas, who's looked at the genetic recovery of the population. So while we've had an increase in numbers and spread of otters, they're gen by looking at uh, the genetic variability by examining otter tissues of these otters that are found dead, Nia has been able to show that they're, they're, uh, they have low genetic variability. So we've got a small effective population size, which could make them vulnerable to inbreeding depression and not be able to respond to um, The riparian habitat is really important to otters, not only to support the, the prey species within the river, but also um, for undisturbed and um, sheltered lying up sites. So they need places to rest that are, they're undisturbed. And there's a question now about, has there been an increase in disturbance or a degradation of this habitat? And as Ian has just outlined, all of the problems that are impacting their prey species, uh, particularly the salmonids, which are um, a very nutrient rich prey for, for otters. Um, although they are a generalist predator that can switch to eating other things that could um, impact. We don't know the impact of having that, that reduced prey as a prey base. And we know that they're um, 
salmonids are, are turning up less in their diet than they used to be and they're switching to smaller prey species like bullhead or um, more amphibians in their diet. But it's really uncertain um, why this is happening. There's lots of potential factors. It's likely to be more than one factor and it requires some more investigation. So what's happening next? NRW have uh, convened a steering group of which I'm a member and we've been looking at gathering data and looking at evidence gaps and, and how we might answer some of these questions. Importantly, they're planning the seventh otter survey of Wales next year so we can get a look at has that decline continued. Um, and uh, Becky Clues Roberts, who's Natural Resources Wales Terrestrial Mammals Advisor, she leads on the Otter Survey Wales work for NRW. She's organising some interim monitoring as well. So we're not waiting eight years always to find out what's happening next. Um, and she would like to encourage people to submit sightings to the local record centre. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with any of that, please do contact Becky. She gave me her permission to share her email address there. And I can put that in the chat too, if that's helpful. And then it just leaves me to stick around for some questions if anyone has any.